how to proceed our Q and A session. Okay. Uh, why don't you do just uh, the, uh, gather some questions first? Uh, anybody can make a question. Just uh, identify yourself, then make a question uh, directed to uh, one of two speakers or well, two speakers. Uh, thanks very much for both of those talks. Uh, Jan, obviously yours is a is a challenge to the the framing of the <coughs> title of the conference, Capitalism and Capitalisms. Why do I, for example, think that it's worth still having a concept of capitalism and not reducing it to varieties of capitalisms? I certainly uh, take your you know, I work within the varieties of capitalism framework, so I'm, I'm very much committed to the idea of institutional legacies, path dependencies, specific forms of political uh, convergence et cetera, within societies, etc. But I still think that it's worth keeping some notion of a system of capitalism, which uh, I, I guess from one perspective traps even the dominant hegemon so that uh, the US does not have freedom to reshape this system. It's, it itself is caught <coughs> within these processes. So uh, the, the US uh, welcomed neoliberalism, welcomed the flow of capital, welcomed, in effect, the possibility of the entry of, of China. And uh, as a result, this, this system is reconstituting. Uh, and the US cannot control that process. It, at a political level, it is still about states, though not just about states, it's also about transnational governance. But I think that uh, the, the notion of capitalism as a, as a system uh, which embraces and, and within which countries can find a role, uh, but nevertheless a system that is beyond the the individual countries and, and which constitutes this, as I say, a sort of, a sort of trap in which they're, they're all caught, I think uh, I'd want to defend that notion of, of capitalism. So I just put that as, <laughs> you know, against what you've said. And uh, in relation to Professor Kim's discussion, I'm particularly interested if he could define a bit more what he thinks the difference is between Japan and Korea. Uh, you made the point about collusion, corruption uh, in Korea being something that's been very difficult to eradicate and yet something that has not established itself to the same degree in Japan, though one could say there, are quite, there have been quite a number of corporate scandals in Japan. So I wonder what, what was it, what, what is the core that makes a difference as to whether big business be begins to rely on corruption and collusion as opposed to being independent and uh, separate from the state and not having to rely on those corrupt relations. Sorry. Thank you, Professor Morgan and the uh, Professor the, uh, Brink. Okay, uh, Tobias Tenbrink uh, from Frankfurt and Witten. I, I can keep it short because I, uh, Glenn already touched upon the questions I already, I, I also had. So the, the, the first one being the idea that there may be forces of global capitalism that must not necessarily be forces by the dominant power that, we, that you refer to that, that are of great importance for understanding uh, yeah, the global diversity as well. Uh, my question is on the second, the last um, um, slide you showed us, the kind of idea that diversity keeps capitalism going. I, I would like to hear a little more about that because I was not yet um, uh, sure what you really mean by that. So what means, especially what, what does keeps going what does it mean? What, 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 what does it stand for? It may be very different aspects to that. Thanks. One more question? Okay. For, uh, for Ian, I, I think that it, it's a very fine grain, grain analysis of components 
of different elements of capitalism over time and space is, is very convincing. Well, what do we gain from it? That is, uh, in a sense, do, if we know that, in fact, there are endless variations, so what is the lesson? And both in terms of theory and for, uh, for, uh, for development. I, I, you know, just, is it, is it, does it, is there a very pessimistic conclusion that as a result of that, uh, you know, there is no a salient or dominant theory, and therefore that uh, let's go whichever ways, but then what are the guidelines for both the theory and development? So I, I wanted to know what your thoughts are. For Professor Kim, a very you know, exciting, I think, uh, analysis in terms of from, uh, from the uh, East Asian perspective. So especially I was thinking about the two waves. Do you draw any conclusions about the comparisons of the two waves? So the first wave, you, you sound like that, uh, you know, it was sort of, uh, you know, getting flame because the J Japan's so overly, you know, sort of ambitious uh, 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 attempt. Uh, now, are we drawing lessons from that wave too? Uh, do you expect China to follow the same step, or in fact, it may differ? So I, I wanted to know your speculation in terms of, given these two different kinds of waves, do we draw any lessons or Maybe we draw lessons for, for them. Thank you. OK, three questions. Odd number, I like it. Uh, let's listen to the response. OK, first, then. OK, Professor Kim first, then. Yeah, next. About this uh, comparison between Korea and Japan in terms of corruption, business scandals, and so on, I, I did not mean to say that Japan had no problem. Uh, it's a matter of relative extent to which uh, this issue has become a uh, difficult problem for each country in terms of uh, the, the whole, the entire uh, society's uh, maintenance of the system itself and also in terms of uh, growing economically. If you look at it from this kind of angle, you will find that uh, the society in Korea uh, seems to be uh, having much more difficulty uh, with the problem of disintegration, integration, conflict, compared with uh, Japanese society in general. Um, and of course, you can, you know, go back to different uh, factors, historical, cultural, and so on, uh, in order to explain the difference here. But uh, somehow in Japan, you uh, seem to have a system where they uh, they try to uh, try not to too much, you know, to distract the uh, system itself. Uh, try to keep harmony or whatever. Uh, that's the general impression that we have. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why we have conflicts may have to do with this uh, uh, depravity, the, the uh, problem of depravity, corruption, and so on in, in society. And from that uh, point of view, Korea seems to be having much more uh, difficult uh, situation here compared to Japan. Um, I don't know. The, you know, I usually compare these two societies from the angle of the tradition of uh, Japan as a basically military society or warrior society versus Korea as being a gentry, literati society. Um, this makes a lot of difference in, you know, in many different ways. But um, when you uh, 
run a country with swords, there are two things you can find interestingly different from others. Number one, uh, whatever you say, whatever you do, will, you know, very quickly uh, run into a situation where your life is at stake. You know, depending on what you say and what you do in the given situation, the sword will immediately catch you or you can be free of that uh, threat. You know, if you are living in this sort of society, I'm not saying that, that Japan still is a you know, militaristic society. I'm saying that tradition is there, embedded in the culture, in such a way that they will be very careful in their behavior, uh, in many ways, compared to uh, the case of Korea. Now, Korea, uh, you are supposed to behave yourself very carefully, you know, according to our Confucian tradition, because this is, a, I think, most Confucian society in the world, much more so even China. We have kept this, you know, Confucian orthodoxy sort of thing, tradition, so long. And, uh, of course, we have been changing uh, since since the uh, early 1920s, uh, 20 centuries, I mean. Um, still, when you are living in, in that kind of Confucian society, you are supposed to behave yourself according to the moral, ethical kind of cause and so on, which does not happen. I mean, in, in everyday life, you don't really uh, go by that rule. But there is also an interesting uh, contrast with Japan in this case, uh, even though Korea, you know, the traditional Joseon dynasty, Korea was a patrimonial state where the king owned everything and he has, you know, omnipotent power to even take your life immediately. We didn't do that. And we not only stayed away from that kind of uh, behavior but we also had an institutionalized system where you can express your uh, grievances and protest, resist, uh, or you can even you know, mention in the face of the ruler what the ruler has been doing wrong, how he has been doing wrong, uh, you know, with the risk of your own life. And this kind of uh, attitudes, you know, towards the power center or whatever, authority, I think is different from the Japanese case. There, you, your uh, authority is the object of your loyalty. Loyalty is, is, is uh, emphasized. Even though both societies have Confucian traditions, the basic difference between these two was that in Japan, loyalty overruled filial piety. In Korea, filial piety overruled loyalty. Uh, and uh, well, this has many different implications, but in this particular case, uh, you are not going to be too much, you know, aggressive in terms of expressing yourself, in, you know, uh, uh, to your uh, superior or to the to the organization in Japan, compared to the case of Korea, where you will find much more open and aggressive kind of uh, attitudes in this sense. And uh, I don't know. This does not explain everything. But uh, at least uh, in Japan, you do have scandals. Well, in any society, you have, you have spent scandals. But I think they are much more careful about these things. Whereas in this society, uh, it is much more open. And uh, also, 
when it is openly revealed that the reaction from the people will be quite different too. We are much more aggressive about this, you know, in protesting and so on. That's one thing. And this will lead to the question uh, by uh, Nan here. Uh, I may have so sounded a little bit, you know, uh, in the uh, in favor of Japan, both in the case of the first and second wave modernization experience, and um, you know, if I did sound like that, then I'm going to be lynched by many nationalists here. <laughs> But, uh, okay, mentioning nationalism, I think, I think ultra-nationalism is one character of characteristic of Japan. Uh, so when you have some problems, the most, the utmost important value would be nationalism, the nation. And, uh, you know, when, when we come to uh, the conflict between Korea and Japan, you know, in terms of all kinds of things, including the uh, territorial uh, issue and so on, we always uh, protest to the J Japanese politicians when they visit this shrine called Yasukuni, where they have, you know, war criminals uh, enshrined there. And uh, we also always insist that Japan should apologize for whatever atrocities they caused during the colonial days and during the war and all, all that. They never apologize, actually. Why? Because once they apologize for those wrongs they have done, those fallacies, they are actually saying that the emperor was responsible for all that, which Japanese never do. They never bring in emperor in this kind of international uh, affairs because the emperor is the nation itself. And I don't think they have uh, discarded this kind of ultra-nationalism uh, as yet. So that's another reason why they will, you know, try to calm down rather than blow it up and, and make make uh, all the, uh, you know, fuss about it. And then here, okay, um, it is true that we have learned a lot from Japan during the colonial day. And, you know, you cannot deny that. Not only that, uh, I, I and my wife uh, have done a little bit of research about the educational background of co the Korean elite. And two papers were uh, <clears throat> published earlier. But uh, in, in this kind of analysis, you will find the most influential educational background will be Japan and US. You cannot leave. Japan out of this picture. So, you know, many of the elite, when we started our uh, development programs and so on, were either educated in Japan or during the colonial days or in, in the United States. But the U.S. comes later, of course, right? So you have this legacy very strongly. Therefore, it will be much easier for the government of officials and the businessmen to deal with the Japanese when they can speak Japanese, right? Uh, so that was the kind of the, the historical background that we should uh, take into account here. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that you know we we you know we like Japan or we respect Japan. Unconsciously, I think we emulate Japan uh, in a, you know, many different ways. Um, now, uh, Japan 
was very nimble about adapting to the changing situation in the first wave of modernization. The other two countries, you know, were unable to even emulate Japan in this case. Uh, this was again, you know, the, the social integration and the role of the elite and the loyalty, you, you know, loyalty to the ruler and the uh, power group authority. And that's how Japan was able to maintain social cohesion in order to achieve whatever purposes they had in mind in emulating and adapting and, and, and modifying uh, the uh, Western cultures and, and then graft, graft them into to their own situation, conditions. Uh, but the other two countries were unable to do that. Although, you know, they tried to learn and study from the West, uh, this was not very successful, uh, either in China or Korea uh, in the earlier part. Now, the second wave, uh, Japan, uh, of course, was already had the infrastructure, cultural and material infrastructure, although destroyed, about 40% industries destroyed, the US was there to help uh, this country to you know, rise, rise again, rehabilitate uh, from the war uh, uh, devastation. But uh, in the other two cases, China had to go through the communist revolution and uh, again, the cultural revolution. All these things uh, were not very helpful for China to sustain itself, you know, and uh, pursue the, uh, the kind of goals that we are talking about here in terms of economic growth and so on. And Korea, again, was, you know, devastated by war and uh, we were divided to and went through very difficult uh, periods. Uh, now, many people would, you know, still debate about this. You know, the background of Park Jung hee he went to normal school. I'm sorry, I have to take so much time. But I'll just finish up. Okay. Right. He went to normal school which teach, which trains teachers, right? Under colonial rule, became a teacher. Okay, who went to normal schools? Those bright guys, the Koreans, who wanted to get education, most of them went to normal schools because higher education was restricted to the Korean people by the colonial Japanese. They did not want to educate you know, two bright guys among the Koreans. Of course, it was not, you know, totally uh, closed. Still, there was there were much restrictions. So many bright guys went to normal schools and became teachers. And then this guy, the, the war broke out. This, this guy decided to become a uh, a military person. So he joined the uh, Manchu uh, Military Academy in China and became an officer in Japanese, in the Japanese military army, right? So you see, he has this strong Japanese background. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, time is running out, yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> you can you can imagine how you you were indoctrinated during the colonial days, because you know as kids we were we were trying to volunteer for the uh, kamikaze special force. Okay, so he was indoctrinated, he was influenced, and that's how we also emulated Japan during our second wave modernization in many ways and uh, the political uh, problems we have also are somehow copycat of the Japanese politics in many ways too. But let, me, let me stop here, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Kim. And Jan, now your turn for five minutes.
Perhaps? First day of conference, <laughs> electricity in the air, three questions, thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I think what we're talking about is a matter of emphasis. It is as if you're saying, look, I want to rescue the singular. We I want to rescue the singular be because it might get lost in the plural. Glenn, it's not necessary. The plural includes the singular, respects the singular. Because otherwise, we wouldn't say capitalisms, we would use another term. We wouldn't say modernities, we would use another category. But the singular, does not respect the plural. The title of the conference wants to have it both ways. Let's do the plural, but let's keep the singular, as if the singular is lost, uh, or would be lost. Um, I think part of the point of the plural is to break the spell of the singular to alter its status, its significance. So the point is epistemological and is analytical. Um, the United States is the driver and driven, it's not uh, in, in, in charge, like it might have been in the previous epoch of hegemony. And we are, we have entered, structurally we have entered, and this is also partly a response to, to your point, uh, Tobias, what is the point of diverse, diverse capitalism keep cap capitalism going? To address the dynamics of the 21st century multipolar world, in which new forces have entered the big game and sit at the global head table, such as the G20, we need a new analytics. In fact, we could perhaps make a map of paradigms, and paradigms, the fortunes of paradigms go down and they go up according to historical cycles. If we are in a period of uncontested, unrivaled hegemony, thinking in universal terms, in singular, works, it's productive. If we are in a time of dispersion, multipolarity, many different energies, we need the plural. So, this is, this is the analytical point, but it's also in part um, a historical point. Um, yes, uh, to Tobias, your question is, um, diversity keeps capitalism going. What do you mean? Uh, explain. Um, time and again, we have singular narratives, Wolfgang Strick, OECD capitalism, um, is facing a structural crisis. And time and again we find that crisis for one part of the system or for one region, the crisis here is an opportunity for others. Yes, there is a global crisis, but the meaning, the impact of that global crisis in different parts of, of the world is very diverse. Um, what is a disaster for some is an opportunity for others. And it is this ongoing undulation and changing of rhythms and opportunity structures that keeps it all ticking. And then maybe at some point we will say, oh, we will need another terminology. Terminologies, we would need another singular. Um, um, because we deal with changing economic dynamics, changing technologies, and with shifting hegemonic centers. Um, so, 
An established point is the critique of metallurgical nationalism, like Ulrich Beck. I want to add to this a critique of metallurgical globalism, uh, because since some years now I work in global studies, and the overuse, the abuse of the global is a growing con concern. Um, uh, Professor Nien, am I pessimistic? Uh, it's a little bit early in the day to answer that question, actually. <laughs> no, but but uh, um, am I pessimistic in relation to theory? On the contrary, on the contrary. If we acknowledge the plural, it opens many windows and, and perspectives, many new theoretical angles and combinations, and it is our ability to uh, acknowledge and deal with the variants that um, will be um, enabling both analytically and politically, because the singular closes doors, not just epistemologically, it closes doors politically. So I'm optimistic. Well, it's, it's almost 12 o'clock. I'm optimistic on both scores, theoretically and politically. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. And the last question from Dr. Schaeffer. My question was, but it should it's probably too late for answering that question. What you think of the particular characteristics of confusion capitalism? And turning to Jan, I agree uh, with your defense of the plural. Um, and uh, I can see theoretical grounds to think about the singular. But I think the plural at this moment is empirically and research-wise much more uh, productive. Uh, and you already also gave an answer of my counterpoint. I think in an age of uh, climate change, for instance, um, that there is some need for universalism. So I would not want to uh, allow, because climate change has uh, 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 a number of things that relate to science and understanding of the natural world. So to let just the market or the political spectrum decide would be dangerous, I think. So I think universalism still has, uh, is a political need, so to speak. Okay, um, well actually I saw the uh, one more hands raised and the uh, Professor Cho from Iwa University. I, I'm Sung Nam Cho from Iwa Women's University, Sociology. And uh, Professor Kim also mentioned the uh, Confucianism uh, for the value system of this uh, different capitalism. But I think uh, if, if we compare uh, East Asian, different version of East Asian countries' capitalism in modern times, what would be the spirit of capitalism in different uh, country, or uh, you know, let's say entrepreneurship or national uh, value system or culture system? That different version of uh, each country has a different spirit of capitalism. For example, uh, how that would be affected to the you know different versions of. Uh, uh, Korean capitalism or uh, Chinese capitalism or Japanese capitalism. That is kind of you know, my question. This is not, of course, a question of um, a critique of metallurgical glo globalism does not mean let us now take the baby and throw it out with the bath water. Um, clearly, ecological changes are situations that need um, global responses, global governance, and the lack of global public goods 
and regard for uh, global commons is one of the great dramas of our epoch, and this is, this is very clear. Um, at the same time, let us recognize, even in relation to these di dynamics, how things have changed. In the old days, we had colonial division of uh, labor, manufactured goods expensive, commodities cheap, raw materials cheap. It's the other way around in the 21st century. Manufactured goods cheap, commodities expensive. We just had a commodity super cycle, 2003, 2009. These dynamics affect the character of our analysis and hence our response to ecological dynamics. So uh, the universal and the plural, etc., are always imbricated and need one another for a, a complete response. Okay, <laughs> this time I'll be brief. Uh, I have just finished a book which includes uh, one chapter, well, actually three chapters on Confucianism and modernization in East Asia. So it deals, you know, in much more detail uh, with this issue. To state the conclusion, <laughs> first, Confucian uh, heritage or legacy still affects our political life in such a way that the politicians, the political men, they don't change, and the people, they don't change. So we, we, we do have this problem of Confucian heritage not Confucianism itself, okay? Because you have to be very selective about which legacies of Confucianism you are talking about. All right, there are certain elements that are hindering our political development. And as you mentioned, in order to overcome our polit political problem and the, the strong hand of, of the state, civil society has to uh, incapacitate himself, empower itself. I'm currently involved in the volunteer movement, and I'm you know, strongly feeling that the civil society has to be strengthened much more in this country. About Confucian capitalism, now, so if you talk about Confucian democracy, I don't think you know, we, we have Confucian democracy. Democracy is democracy, Confucianism is Confucianism, and in the development of democratic politics, you may have certain Confucian elements interfering, but not Confucian version of democracy. I don't think we have that yet, all right? Confucian capitalism, the same. We don't have any Confucian capitalism based on the Confucian ideology, Confucian views of, of the economy. We have developed capitalism, no. We don't have that. Uh, I don't know, maybe in the future somebody will come up with a Confucian theory of economy and say, okay, we apply this to our capitalist development. That's fine. That's Confucian capitalism. That's Confucian democracy, right? But here, the only role Confucianism has played to me is that you are adapting to the changing situation on your own capacities and preparedness, culturally and physically, whatever, in developing, say, a, capital, a capitalist economy. But Confucianism did not provide any guideline, guideline for capitalist economic development in any society. Only, again, Confucianism interferes when you to, when you try to build up an, an economy in a capitalist mold, you will find that yourself getting involved in some Confucian thinking in your organization, in your uh, way of uh, trying to you know, build up your economy. So I don't think there is anything called Confucian capitalism. Capitalist spirit is capitalist spirit. And uh, Confucianism has not provided that kind of spirit for our capitalist development, period. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Professor Kim and the, uh, Professor Peterson. Why, why don't you give them a big hand? <laughs>